A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm very happy that you have enrolled for this course. And uh, today's brief lecture would be on the, you know, introduction of the concept of One Health. What is One Health? How do we view One Health from a public health perspective? How do we manage the uh, different partners and stakeholders uh, in this One Health complex? So when we say One Health, what exactly do we mean? It has become a very buzzword or a fashionable term to use especially after COVID-19 pandemic. But do we really understand the finer nuances or of the subject or how complex and how, uh, you know, uh, it will be complex to deal with so many stakeholders, partners. So we will go through the different aspects of One Health management of these zoonotic infections. One Health is a big umbrella where a lot of other topics also come, but I'll be focusing on zoonotic infections. So uh, on only because coming from the background of communicable diseases and uh, zoonosis are communicable diseases which spill over from animals to humans and human beings suffer. So that is a public health concern from human animal. But human health cannot be divorced or cannot be separated from animal health, from environmental health, from plant health. So seeing that human health in That's the true. context of all the other, uh, all the other uh, you know, units of in terms of environment is extremely important. So uh, we will talk about One Health application in management of zoonotic diseases. As explained earlier, One Health will be can be a big umbrella. Even food security, food safety, pesticide use, antimicrobial resistance, climate change, everything comes under One Health. Where you need multiple disciplines. But here we will focus today on zoonotic diseases. The topics which we will cover today are what are zoonotic disease and the role in our changing environment, changing world, understanding of bacterial, viral, parasitic zoonotic diseases. These diseases can be more, they can be fungal, they can be any other pathogen as well. And what, how are local and national governments and these factors they influence and how do we assess our programs and the spread of zoonotic infections. So today we will see, uh, we will come to understand what is One Health, what is the importance of One Health, what are the issues surrounding the concept of One Health. Then we will focus on zoonotic infections and One Health. What have been the success stories? Do we have any success story where the partners have come together and they have delivered something very well? We will come to that. What are the global advancements and Indian advancements towards One Health? India being a developing country, we are taking baby steps towards it, but definitely we are on track. Then what are the different strategies which can be used for implementation of One Health as a concept? So what is One Health? So when we say One, One Health, One Planet, now something it has become very in slogan, One Nation, One Rule, something all those political slogans also are there. But when we say One Health, we means everybody's health. It has to be seen in a in together, you know, as a continuum of one another. It cannot be separated. Right. When you see one family, if the head of the family is not well, the effect will extrapolate or percolate to the all members of the family. Similarly, our environmental health, animal health will, will affect human health as well. So here we are from the public health concern. We are worried about the human health here, which is affected by animal health, environmental health and all the other factors. Now we are also talking about economic statuses, equities, availability, accessibility, all these issues will also affect the human health. So this is basically collaborative. What do you mean when we say, what do you mean when we say collaborative? So it works at multiple levels and a lot of people involved in it, not only one single discipline of human health or, or only Ministry of Health. It has to be Ministry of Urbanization, uh, Urban Health, Rural Development, Public Works Department, engineering section, legal section, all these people need to come together. And it is multi-sectoral. All different kind of people, botanist, veterinary people, environmental specialist, all this will come together towards one goal of, goal of achieving better health for animals as well as humans. So One Health con concept is also transdisciplinary. How this term is different from multi-sectoral. So when we say transdisciplinary, the control programs or the research or any mitigation activity 
has to flow seamlessly from one sector to another. Being multi-sectoral means everybody is working in their own offices and rooms. When we say transdisciplinary, it flows from one, one sector to another sector and they're all interconnected. See, all these are theoretical references, which you will always be, these PPT will be available to you. They are available on these links as well. You can go through the links, but I'm just sharing you a brief glimpse of the different terminologies used in the paradigm of One Health. And these are not only just catchphrases, they have very deeper meaning attached to it. So definitions of One Health, I'm looking at One Health from past many years now, and I think it's an evolution of the concept as well. So earlier, like I'm talking about 2012 or 13 or 2010, we used to feel One Health means even that term was not used very often. We used to be only restricted to zoonotic infections which transmit to humans from animals. But now we are talking about One Health. Different organizations have given kind of a similar, similar and maybe a little different definitions. 2021 is the latest definition coming from WHO and many other partner organization, which is in the red one. So this is a beautiful pencil which shows the continuum of our understanding of our concept of One Health. 2017, WHO gave this definition. Then there is a CDC definition. But more or less, they mean multiple sectors have to come together to address the issues of animal health and human health. So it's beyond the status of a mere concept to become a truly global movement. So people after COVID pandemic, they understood. We all, we all have read news and in COVID pandemic 19, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, everybody is much more educated because ease of information is available on internet how it started all from Wuhan in December 2019. There were live animal markets and still it is a mystery and an enigma how the infection was it from a live animal market, whether did it jump the species to human beings or whether it was always there in human beings but at a very, very low level or whether it was laboratory made. We are not getting into that controversy but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we understood we cannot separate human health from animal health. And because of the close proximity of animals to humans, they will always be interlinked. They cannot be separated. So this was, many years it was limited to interdisciplinary collaboration in human veterinary and also somewhere, somewhat to wildlife. But now we know it is much more than that. So this is a paradigm shift, but we uh, you know, always call, it's an, an understanding also is a major shift how One Health is affected by many of the uh, factors and it is not only zoonotic infections or not only a concept, but it has to be truly accepted and worked upon. It's a holistic approach. So if you see this uh, simplistic diagram, so where there is there is uh, there are wheels here of communication, collaboration, capacity building, coordination, all this starting with C. Then what are the different of sectors of, uh, you know, involved? Animal, environment, human. At society level, urban, rural, peri-urban communities, the peri-urban communities are far more at risk and susceptible. So all these things will, will evolve and they will influence human health. So it involves everyone. If you see this simple figure of how cow and a dog is there, plant are, plants are there, human beings are there, and because of wide and global travel, now no part of the world is isolated one. America cannot think what is, what is happening in India doesn't bother us. Of course, it will bother, bother everybody. A small outbreak in Somalia will have an impact on Europe. And monkeypox, the latest one, is a beautiful example how this particular outbreak has shown that disease from African countries has reached earlier also, Europe and America. So coordination of partners is extremely important. There are many relevant players besides health so that includes law enforcement, policy makers, agriculture, communities, pet owners, veterinarians, animal handlers. All these people are involved in, in, in uh, affecting human health. Of course, there is a set of professional people, medical, non-medical, paramedical or veterinary. All these need to come together, environmentalist. So a lot of mutual collaboration will be required. So this will involve many sectors and many kind of professionals. So one health means diverse background people working towards one goal, one aim, that is improving the health of humans primarily, but I would like to take it to of animals as well. So why it is important? 
that suddenly it has gained so much of importance. There are many factors why people are now sitting up and staring at the screens and talking about One Health. It's not only in India, but internationally as well. <coughs> Intensive agricultural practices have led to some way degradation of environment, use of more chemicals and pesticides into environments. And Lord, all these years have also leading to somewhere in changes in the climate. Climate change is the latest buzzword now. And it's a climate crisis now, that's what it's called. So 1.5 degree rising temperature will create havoc in, in, uh, in our environment. And you can always appreciate how now winter, summers and rains have changed over time. How in Delhi, especially pollution levels are such thick high and we are not able to do anything, we are so helpless. So all these factors we are influencing disease patterns also in India and, and across the world. People are you know, located very densely in the urban areas, people living close to, closer together. Transmission of infection is much frequent and much higher intensities. There's a more of global travel. I was at the airport yesterday and I felt everybody's in the plane and everybody at the airport in such close proximity. It's so easy to exchange infections nowadays. So animals are just more than food because uh, the you know animals are being reared in at a scale of a factory for food. But they are not just food; they transmit infections also within themselves, within the species, and to human beings. So we have some common one health issues. So one health is not just, as I said earlier, zoonotic diseases. Even though I mean I, I work in this area, but I fully understand. There are many, many other important health topics which are connected to One Health. So these are besides zoonotic infections, antimicrobial resistance, which will become a biggest threat in coming time. It has become a threat. You look at with multi-resistant, uh, multi-drug resistant TB, drug resistant malaria, a common infections, to a common antibiotics. The broad spectrum antibiotics are not working. Like, like you know. Uh, streptomycin or uh, are commonly used drugs will not work. So antimicrobial resistance is a very, very important topic and it is being recognized one of the biggest threats to human beings where the drug discovery cannot happen at that pace and development of a new drug, new molecule will talk long years. But if we keep on, you know, uh, making the available drugs unusable, it will become very difficult to treat infection, especially for the elderly and for the immunocompromised in children will become a major problem. Food safety and security is another issue. Whether disease in food, in food, in animals, plants, food products will threaten food security and security of the food safety and, and security among the people because with the climate change, there will be, you know, I mean, uh, the change in the rains, it spoils the entire crop. And they're the, you know, they're the uh, availability of that that particular crop becomes very less. Prices uh, skyrocket. People are not able to afford those expensive food. So it it does affect because all this will have effect on the on the day to day living of the human beings. So that is the problem. Vector borne diseases. We all understand vector borne disease. Be a mosquito borne infection like malaria, dengue, chikungunya, or tick and mite borne infections. They are uh, sensitive to climate. They, they are showing different endemicity patterns now. Where, like Himalayan region, where there were no mosquitoes, no malaria. Now you can see these things. Dengue is a special threat, threat across the globe. And uh, the transmission windows broaden and expand in these, uh, you know, non earlier they were non recipient areas like Himalaya, Himalayan region, or let us say Northeast or you know, Jammu Kashmir. Now, all of these have seen invasion of the mosquitoes and they bring disease. Tick bone and mite bone infections are on the rise in India. I'll give you an example of KFD and CCHF. So, vector bone infections are very sensitive to climate change and they are definitely a good example where one health as a concept should work well. Environmental contamination, as I said, uh, extreme or high usage of chemical pesticides is leading to environmental degradation. It's a perfect example how use of pesticide has wiped out, uh, you know, drastically reduced the honeybees and all these pollinators, how the use of tetracycline has decreased the, the propensity of vultures. And, you know, so all these animals have been affected by, by our environmental contamination. And there are many more subjects, as I said, climate change, 
poverty all these are under the umbrella of unhealth focusing just on zoonotic infections if we see so these are the infections which are naturally transmissible between humans and animals in either direction but we are more concerned when they come from animals to humans humans become the recipient of the infection and we keep on suffering there is also called as reverse zoonosis where from humans the infection goes back to animals so those are fewer ones the common ones are from um, animals to humans so there are over 200 known types of zoonotic infections they can be bacterial viral parasitic fungal they can be many more uh, etiological agents to it but majorly bacterial viral and parasitic so they cause a major public health concern and they can spread by direct contact or indirect contact through domestic agriculture or wild animals through food and water through environment through touch through frequent handling of animals feces urine or even uh, you know eating of dead animals eating of or handling of carcasses best example is anthrax so any of the routes of transmission can happen the common example which all of you must have heard rabies we all know it happens in the dog bite most probably then uh, salmonella infection we always make fun pani puri has e coli or you know salmonella so you know that kind of food food uh, certain foods are more prone for food borne pathogens infections are quite common bestel viral infections q fever is under recognized but is a very important infection anthrax brucellosis lyme ringworm ebola nipa zika so nipa zika ebola they began as zoonotic infection later on they became human to human transmission right but they all began as a zoonotic infection so that's why they are in the list so there are many more more examples they just the beginning of them and when we say emerging and re emerging zoonotic infections they become a specific one health challenge because when we say emerging that means the uh, the healthcare worker or the doctor they are not well versed with these diseases clinically how to treat them how to handle them in people what messages to give to the community it's very unsure so we don't know how to handle these diseases that happened with covid 19 also right we didn't know we start we said ki it is spread by somebody will cough on the surface clean the surface don't handle uh, parcel packed packets wash the vegetables we were not even sure of the sure of the roots of transmission so it was all hit and trial method because it was a new disease uh, we were not knowing what to do with the disease and the infection how to stop the infection so all hit and trial method but after a lot of research we know so it is not a surface contaminant it happens by spread wearing a mask will protect us we do not need that suit the entire protective suit mask is good enough washing our hands is good enough so so on and so forth for covid 19 is a best example how an emerging infection in the shortest window of one and a half or two years we have come up with such such robust scientific evidence and we have kind of you know it's a dynamic process we kept on changing our uh, thinking and as evidence came up which also changed our recommendations also for the treatment part for the diagnostic part for the community messages so that's how it is so when we say emerging infections where will they emerge from it can happen from live animal market as is the example in covid 19 or avian influenza or coming from animals wildlife animals uh, by virtue of hunting or the people go into interior of forest for collecting uh, fodder or food and they get exposed to all these wild animals so they can bring in the disease like monkey pox has come up from people who go into wild uh, wild wild areas so domestic animals can spread nipa avian influenza rabies coming from pet animals or wildlife farming so animals from different uh, you know sources be it pet animals or domestic farming animals milk animals all wildlife they can all be source of infections for emerging zoonotic disease i will encourage you all of you to look into definition when do you call any infection emerging and re emerging infection when it is endemic when it is epidemic when it is outbreak these are not simple terms they are epidemiological terms with some objective criteria attached to it how do we define these terms so i will encourage all of you to take notes see the latest uh, you know reference material of who cdc or even government of india see the definitions of these 
uh, infections? When do you call elimination? When do you call eradication? So zoonotic infection per se is very tough to eradicate or eliminate because there is an animal reservoir. But still we can do that. So there's a target of zero human rabies death by 2030 for rabies. So there are definite objective targets attached to it. But as I, as I said, these terms which I'm just uh, using in a, this half an hour lecture, please look up to them, uh, look into literature, search, and try to remember these terms. And when you use them in your conversation, use them intelligently. Don't use them loosely, like eradication. People, uh, you know, kind of uh, interchange the words, elimination, eradication, control, they are different meanings. So we need to stick to those. So when I say emerging, please look up what is emerging and re-emerging infection and all those terms which I said earlier. So it is said that, you know, currently all the human infections, 60% of them are coming from zoonotic origin and emerging infection more or less will be coming from zoonotic uh, origin. So we need to be very, very careful and we need to pay a lot of attention to the infections originating from the animal source. It can be the animal meat or animal product like mink, fur, it can be leather, it can be, it can be uh, uh, milk and milk products, it can be feces, urine, animal handling, saliva, it can be anything related to animal can be a source of infection. And it has also been used as a bioterrorism agent, like this thing, anthrax, botulinism so they are plague so many many of the diseases have the potential to be a bioterrorism agent so what are the usual mode of transmission of zoonotic as any infectious disease commonly we bracket them into direct and indirect contact so when we say direct contact it can be through saliva blood urine close skin to skin contact when you are petting your animal and children tend to kiss their pet dog on nose on mouth so there is exchange of fluids between the animal and the human beings, feces, mucus, body fluids, petting, touching, bites, scratches. All this will lead direct deposition of the infected, infective organism into the human beings. It can be direct mouth to mouth touch by a dog or whatever, you know, skin. Your skin is broken. You already have a cut and you are petting an animal. It licks you on the cut. Directly the, uh, the organism goes into the body because there's always also a breach on the skin. So these are all direct contacts. When we say indirect contacts, so people can, uh, you know, uh, acquire these infections via uh, mosquito, via food, or via waterborne. All enteric infections can, enteric infections are a perfect example of waterborne infection, foodborne infections, which are infected with the feces or any animal product. So these are the usual transmission uh, routes. I also encourage you to read textbooks for Remembering these, what infection is spread by what route? That is surely going to come in your, not only exams, but it's, it's only, it's, it's also good for your own understanding. So transmission of zoonosis, so we say airborne, transmission of viruses, droplet infections. So an ease of transmission, we also understand. If it is an airborne infection, you don't even need an animal in between. You know, it's, it's, it's already in the air, you just need to inhale it as in COVID-19. So we said you wear a mask where you don't inhale those droplets. So luckily, it's a bigger droplet which will be filtered off by even a simple cloth mask. If it's a very finer one which will not be filtered except by N95, too bad. Because that's going to add a, make it more complex to prevent infections. And if it's spread through animal touch, Okay, you tell people that don't touch the animal. It can still be curtailed, or curtailed. But by the you know by the method of transmission, you have to give messages to community how to prevent, right? So it's a vector. It's a bite of the vector, be it a mosquito or a sandfly or a tick or a mite or a direct contact with animals like bites. So you have to break the chain of transmission at that point. How the infection is getting transmitted? whether it is through urine and feces, like in toxoplasmosis, whether it is through meat, whether that is salmonella. So you have to see how that particular organism is getting transmitted. To break the chain, you have to act at that level. So this is a very nice and simple slide. How to understand at what stage of, you know, zoonotic infection will emerge and how it will get established in the 
in the communities or in the population. So first is pre-emergence. I'm just giving you example of viral infection. It can be anything. So anticipation. So when you say, okay, this infection is in the animals. So what is the requirement from public health angle? You need a constant surveillance mechanism or a vigilance mechanism on animals. Sorry for that. So, uh, so when it is in animals, so we need a constant surveillance mechanism of screening of the animals and uh, detecting any pathogen in them early on. Imagine if they are, I mean, in the picture they are shown bat and monkey and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, langurs or orangutans or whatever animal they are. So primates. So these and is also a rat. These can also be in the wild animal. They can also be the bridge population between wild animal and the domestic population. So we, they are at the fringes of the forest. So they become bridge. So what is required? If there are reports of monkeys dying in the forest in large numbers, so there is an alert system. Okay, 100 monkeys have died in past, let's say one week. So there must be some outbreak of an infection in the monkeys. Now that has to be tested. Feces can be picked up. Droppings of these animals can be picked up for detection. But you, what you require is a very robust alert system in the wildlife, in the forest, in the fringe animals, okay, which are the bridging population between wild animal and the domestic one. So if these two population, you see deaths of the animal, that has to be alerted and that has to be detected. So that means when these two populations are affected, wildlife and the bridge population, next, where the infection will flow to the domestic animal and to human beings. At that point, it has to be curtailed, right? By, again, by surveillance and by prompt management of the patients. So when it comes to human beings, early detection is the backbone of any successful management, clinical management program. You do syndromic surveillance. So when a patient comes to you, he comes to you with fever, with, with respiratory infections, skin lesions, something. So you treat them, run a battery of tests, possible differential diagnosis, run all the possible pathogens he can carry, run the test, detect, treat, so that you curtail it. But when that doesn't happen, it goes into localized transmission. One person will spread it to another one and third one, and that's how it becomes, you know, the spread happens between the humans. Now, in the third, third column, you do not need a wildlife animal here. It is happening within human beings, like Zika. Or, or like, I mean, Zika is a vector bone thing, but let us say Nipah. So human-to-human uh, uh, -human transmission was happening in Nipah in Kerala. So that's how the uh, contact tracing becomes important for containing the spread. So when that is not good, it becomes more uh, more uh, spread. Then you put on the major, uh, measures of quarantine, contact tracing, strictly restricting the people with the infection, their movement. And then if that is also not controlled, it becomes a global spread because of the uh, you know very rampant travel and people are coming from one country to another. They are in the asymptomatic phase. They are in the incubatory phase. You cannot detect all traveling people uh, with a, with, with a te diagnostic test and they will escape detection and spread infection from one place to another. So this is just a glimpse of uh, past pandemics of zoonotic er origin. History is extremely important and very interesting. And one has a lot of lessons to learn from in uh, from history. Spanish flu is a perfect example of what all could be learned and COVID pandemic could be maybe handled better or not. Also, it was done very well. But there are some very crucial lessons in the past pandemics of the Nordic origin. And this slide is showing the country of origin where these pandemics happened. This slide will be with you. I will encourage you to read this paper where, where and there are many more other papers also on these uh, outbreaks. It's very interesting. You will see some common lessons in all these pandemics. And then we can also think of responses we could have mounted. Even in COVID-19, what could have been done differently to prevent such high death rate in COVID-19 pandemic, even in the US or in India? There were so many problems of black fungus, oxygen shortage. We were not prepared enough. People were not counseled enough. So there's always a lesson to pick up from any pandemic. So these are just a glimpse of 
zoonotic origin pandemics across the world and since past many years. So if you see the timeline, this is kind of a carry forward of the previous uh, slide where I was talking about pandemics and beginning from the Spanish flu is a famous example. It took around you know, uh, a couple of years to settle down, then it was all fine. But at multiple time points, these pandemics of global uh, zoonosis, I mean, uh, uh, glo global impact have happened over the years. So what do you mean by zoonotic spillover? And how do these infections come from animals to human beings? How do they, how do they occur? So when, what, what, what do we mean by spillover? The first stage is the original host is animal. So natural species reservoir typically contain low level of pathogen because they are the natural reservoir. They have reached an equilibrium with the pathogen. Pathogen will not harm the animal much because pathogen wants the animal to survive so that pathogen can continuously transmit itself. So there is equilibrium in terms of sufficient immunity to prevent death and prevent a lot of morbidity and disease, but enough susceptibility so that the pathogen keeps on getting transmitted. So that means natural species contain low level of pathogen. It may transfer to a new species. This is called uh, known as zoonotic spillover. So when it goes to the new species, the new species of animal or human, they are not immune to the pathogen. They are totally susceptible. That is why the pathogen will multiply much faster because there's absolutely no immunity to the pathogen in the new, new host. And there is replication, which leads to more mutations and it becomes pathogen become more, become more virulent. And third is when it reaches the human host, amplification becomes much more aggressive from the intermediate host increases. It is for the opportunity for the pathogen to mutate and infect more and more humans and it becomes more virulent. So you can see how the stage one, two, three can happen. There are many examples of such diseases. Also, we have given you the uh, references. Please go through these papers for the basic understanding how these things happen. So what are the pathways which will facilitate this spillover? And what are the barriers we can create to minimize the spillover? So spillover of a pathogen from wildlife reservoir into human or livestock host requires a pathogen to overcome hierarchical series of barriers, which are described on the right. And interventions can be planned at different stages. If a system, if we are developed country, if we are developed country, so we will have multiple, uh, you know, multiple possibilities where we can intervene and create barriers for the spillover and prevent the spillover from animals to humans. So we can see from the beginning reservoir host distribution where the host density is manageable, pathogen prevalence is there, but manageable. Infection intensity can increase if there is a spillover, pathogen release from reservoir host, so on and so forth. And you can intervene at any level, but the more further down we go for intervention, it will become difficult to control. We should try to control in the initial stage when they are still restricted to wildlife or to animal population. For that, you need a constant dialogue with the animal sector. That's where the importance of One Health comes. So why it is important that human beings are so concerned about animal and animal health, besides affecting human health, animal health also is affected. And that is the economic cost to the to the, to the population, to the human being, where you lose millions and millions of dollars or rupees, and you also take away food security from people. Outbreak in animals, death from the disease, animal will become unhealthy, they will die. So productivity will be lost. Imagine if all the cows suffer from some infection where the milk production cannot be there. So milk will be less and the demand will be more. Meat will not be available. Eggs will not be available from poultry. It can affect fishes. It can affect any animal which is seen as food. So that economic loss is there. What will happen if it happens in human beings? There's a medical cost. Zoonotic infections need to be treated. People will get admitted to hospitals. There's mortality and morbidity. When you say mortality, it means death. Morbidity means illness. And there, there will be the workforce will be affected. There will be no productivity. 
if you see in the quantum of money economic impact of bird flu was 1.75 lakh crore in the poultry industry and uh, so you can see in 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 how west has been affected so economic cost definitely is a big big challenge to us so in this slide there are i mean i'm just listed in these three baskets what are the common but very important zoonotic infections from public health viewpoint viral rabies chaplet encephalitis nipa kft cchf bacterial brucellosis understudied but it affects the domestic animals and so on and so forth there are many parasitic you don't even uh, understand the true burden of these diseases so you can see the year of outbreaks from 2001 to 18 how so many outbreaks have happened and they continually affecting our human health so kfd is an example of endemic zoonotic infections in india this has been uh, icmr the national institute of virology in pune they have been at the forefront of studying this disease in in depth and so this was diagnosed and detected way back in 1957 mortality rate in the infected cases is between 3 to 10% which is pretty high and uh, it causes outbreaks in the in the animal population and humans also uh, get affected and there is a vaccine which is not very good but that's the only one we have currently we are trying to make efforts to improve the vaccine but the spread of kfd from humans to animal uh, from animals to humans need to be prevented and here comes the role of multiple partners and multiple sectors as well so these are the transmission and the you know how the transmission happens of the kisnor forest disease so from the ticks and uh, it can transmit to let us say first to monkeys or a rat it goes to wildlife and where you interact with those animals in any way you know when i'm talking about the bridge population there are some wild rodents which are the field rodents and people go for farming and these rodents are there they act as bridge population between wildlife and human beings or they can be your pet animals so person to person transmission has not been noticed but only with exposure to animals with the ticks so this can happen so or it can go into domestic animals and when you are you know handling the domestic animals it can be transmitted to humans and even when the person goes to the forest for firewood and all those things so there are multiple routes of exposure of human beings to ticks and these to animals so that is why it is important for people to be very aware they should take preventive measures to prevent themselves from getting affected so this is the kfd status there are several papers published on kfd you can go through the literature you can just go on pubmed google scholar kfd in india and a plethora of papers will come out of nib pune is mostly nib pune is work in vcrc work now so you can see the uh, you know the studies done and where the incidence of the whether it has been detected in the newer areas you can see the spread in the you know uh, uh, western ghats of kerala these are seen so now coming to the happy story of where one health can become a success so till now we have been dealing with the challenges quickly i'll tell you how goa has achieved the distinction of being uh, you know uh, rabies death no rabies death has happened there so it is rabies free so this is the first uh, state to achieve that distinction and that you know it's an achievement for us so there was a uh, you know internationally funded project which looked into goa's uh, epidemiological scenario of rabies they intervened provided vaccine supported the state government and they drastically brought down the death rate and now to zero so multiple efforts were made and as i said in a one health approach because the animal husbandry communities catching old or stray dogs getting them vaccinated all were tried and done and the goa state being goa being a very progressive state they could achieve this feat but india there is a huge burden of rabies i think india contributes largest to the you know as a country to the burden of rabies related deaths to the world numbers so who advancements in uh, uh, one health approach 
Recently, in 2021, there has been, or in October 22, there has been the latest document on uh, on One Health, how countries should view and develop their programs. Again, as I said, all these organizations, as I said, food security also is a One Health issue. Animal Health is a One Health organization, is a One Health issue. So all these international organizations have come together, developed an expert panel where they guide and guide the countries in driving and leading their own local programs towards making the human health better from the One Health perspective. So what are the strategies for implementing One Health? So more than catchphrases, we require real action on the ground. So what do we need? First of all, for any program to succeed, we need political leadership. We need political commitment so that we are able to function in a country. We are able to secure the support what we need from different sectors. So having said that, when Prime Minister, uh, you know, Honorable Prime Minister comes on TV and talks about vaccination for COVID-19, the entire nation sits up and talks about it and take no note of it. And that's how the ownership of the program happens. Similarly, so you require Ministry of Health and other ministries who are dealing with it to own the program and to carry out the work with the cooperation and support of all the related departments. That's how we need to begin talking about it. So we need robust public and animal health systems and also to comply with the international standards of our functioning. And we should also think of the poorest man in the society. So when we say uh, climate change is a big issue for the entire world, but if you say cut down emissions, don't use fossil fuels, developing and poor nations will not be able to cut down the resilience on fossil fuels. So they should be given more opportunities and more uh, options for cleaner fuels. So developed countries need to step in. They, are, they have more wealth. Similarly, if you see within India, it is the poorest of the poor who will be most affected by the zoonotic infection. Person who are going into the wildlife to collect food and water and fodder and you know firewood, they are the ones get affected most because they are more exposed to animals. So as in general, as any society with any disease, the compromised, socially disadvantaged section of society gets most affected. We need to work around that, how to protect and empower that group. So we have a framework of, you know, India is taking some step towards develop, developing this One Health framework. So we, it's a, it's been many years, you know, not by the catchy phrase of One Health, but we have been working on zoonotic infections from very long time. So India established National Standing Committee on Zoonosis, which is hubbed or housed or in the National Center for Disease Control under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, where multiple sectors our take participate, including ICMR, including many other organizations, and they sit on one table and talk about it. So multidisciplinary roadmap to combat genosis was laid down in 2008, and this is being followed up. Now NCDC Ministry of Health has a very robust and a vibrant program on One Health. You please look up into the documents. So there is development of Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy, uh, which uh, launches the programs and schemes for the prevalence for the prevention of animal diseases in a one health paradigm and icmr has been in discussion now finally the institute is coming up in nagpur which is dedicated to one health with the bsl4 laboratory facility niv pune has a bsl4 it means we have a laboratory uh, which is very capable of handling high risk pathogens possibility of animal origin but with no risk or very minimal risk of you know, transmission to the outer environment. So we have we have dedicated research efforts toward One Health, and DBT also recently launched one consortium where many of the organizations across uh, departments are participating. So what is the future of One Health, and how should we see it? So COVID pandemic, COVID nineteen pandemic, as I said earlier, opened many doors of our thinking, of our understanding, and that's how we have gone ahead to you know, consolidating our plans on One Health and increasing policy coordination, coherence, uh, supporting one another, bringing all stakeholders together via and generating scientific evidence is extremely important. And that is how all will be, uh, all sectors are needed together for a more resilient and equitable systems 
from the poorest man standing in the line from that angle. So I think this is the last slide. So with One Health, it's possible that we prevent outbreaks. It's possible that we control our endemic infections, control epidemics and pandemics. We reduce antimicrobial resistance, which is the next threat or the threat even currently now. We increase the food safety and security for people, for the poorest of the poor people, especially in the, in the neglected areas, in the hard to reach remote areas. So overall, we improve human and animal health. And also, maybe my slide should also have a component of environmental health. That also is so important because, because of the climate change and all these factors affecting environmental health. So it's everybody's health. Together, we have to take it together, not piecemeal, but we need to you know, carry forward everybody's and every, every creature's agenda with each other. That's the only way we can, we can sustain health for, for everyone, including animals. So with this, we have come to the end of the, end of the class. So we, these lectures will be available online to you. And uh, you can uh, feel free to contact uh, through the, you know, through the course coordinators. Any uh, query or questions can be answered. So this is the, I'll encourage you to read a lot on the on One Health, how best we can use our resources. And of course, we will require more resources on capacity building, training of the systems and the people. So thank you so much for listening to this lecture.